do right here is go back. Way back. Back into time. We can rebuild him. We have the technology. Celebrating 20 years of New England Championship Wrestling. This is the Regeneration Podcast. And now, here are your hosts, Sheldon Goldberg, Joe Matarazzo, and Kevin Castro. Welcome everyone to episode 10 of the Regeneration Podcast, celebrating 20 years of New England Championship Wrestling. Sheldon Goldberg here along with my excellent co-host, Joe Matarazzo. Hi, Joe. Hello. And Kevin Castro. Gentlemen. And on this episode, we are going to be wrapping up our review of the 20th anniversary collection. We have two more matches to review, which completes our review of all of the matches in the series. Those matches, the first one up, is going to be from June 16th of 2007. Claudio Castagnoli, the artist currently known as Cesaro, taking on Pepper Parks, the artist currently known as the Blade in AEW. And from there, we're going to go to August 8th, 2010, 10th anniversary of New England Championship Wrestling. The Portuguese Princess Ariel and Sammy Lane taking on the duo of Ivy and Mercedes, the artist currently known as Sasha Banks in her first professional wrestling match. We also have a bonus match. We're going to take another look at our good friend Darling Damon. In fact, we're going to see his debut match in NECW, which took place June 1st, 2008 at the Hot Dog Safari in Suffolk Downs in East Boston, Massachusetts. He takes on the Japanese Nightmare Cahagas, now billed as the Tokyo Monster Cahagas. He would go on to become an NWA World Heavyweight Champion, NWA North American Champion. Uh, he made other appearances for NECW. This was part of a tournament to crown an NECW Television Champion. We'll be looking at that a little bit later. And uh, we'll find some other stuff to talk about as well. But right now, let's get to our first match. Claudio Castagnoli versus Pepper Parks. This match was part of a tournament that took place in various promotions around the country to crown an NWA World Heavyweight Champion. We hosted two matches in the opening round of the tournament. This one that you were about to talk about, and another one which is in the NECW Legendary Series, which involves Finn Balor, then known as Fergal Devitt, Prince Fergal Devitt, as he takes on Mikey Nichols. So that match is up on there, and uh, maybe we'll throw a link on there to that, because that was a great match as well. So let's get your impressions, Joe. Let's start with you. Uh, well, first of all, let me ask you a question. So at the time, the NWA World Heavyweight Championship was up for grabs. That's correct. Uh, how did it get vacated at this point? Bring us, a, mm. Give us a little bit of history if we know it. Who was the champion before this was going on? And, or was this during their resurgence when they were coming back again? This was Would that have been when they separated from TNA? Yes, that's correct. Gotcha. That, that's what okay. happened. They separated from TNA. They were going to crown a new NWA World Heavyweight Champion, and they had this national tournament. And even though we were not members of the National Wrestling Alliance at that particular time, my relationships with Bob Trovich, who was the executive director of the NWA, and David Marquez from Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, they prevailed upon me to give them two matches Actually, they sent the guys here. They paid the guys to be here. All we had to do was host the matches, film them, and send them the video because they put this out as a commercial uh, DVD release eventually. So uh, that was our role. And the fact that we had these connections and these relationships with Marquez and with uh, Bob Trovich, that was what uh, was the impetus for this to happen. So that was another advantage that NECW had over other companies in the area. Uh, just the fact that uh, over the years I developed all these relationships and had all these connections. A and that's what the genesis of, of that match was. That's how it came about. Knowing that, let's uh, get into your impressions on the match, Joe. Well, I'll tell you, it was it was, it was was fun to watch right off the beginning because as soon as it started off, there was just some good old-fashioned heat by uh, uh, Claudio uh, Cesaro. Uh, just a way of getting the crowd going and and working the the referee in and uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I had never seen um, 
Claudio, or Pepper mm. at that time, only on the magazines. That's mm. the only place I'd ever mm. seen them. We didn't have the internet like we do now. Uh, back then, it was limited. But um, so to get to see these guys in their uh, early stages, um, you could tell both guys, the shape that both guys were in then was right. great. Mm. Now, you look at them, what is it, 13 years later, right. the two of them are jacked. They look right. unbelievable now. Cesaro's mm-hmm. probably pound for pound one of the strongest guys um, in wrestling. Right. Um, and then, and Pepper just, the guy you could shred lettuce off him, you know, uh, mm. Pepper looks great as the blade over in AEW. I did pop when I saw Claudio using the uh, European uppercuts mm. because he's turned that into such, you know, a, a trademark move. And right. to use a couple of them right then was, was cool to watch. I love the, the, I don't know what you'd call the cross face power bomb that he used mm. um, at the end on Pepper. So weird to see the two of them both with hair. <laughs> where where they, they did, it, it it was a little a little strange, but man, just it's just a great. You can see why they were in the tournament. Both guys um, really brought it, really brought the fire in, and uh, good, just a great match to watch. Mm-hmm. Kev, what what were your thoughts? My first thought was that just from seeing different videos and, and hearing stories about Claudio, is that he is pretty much the front personification of Mister Perfect. Like mm-hmm. what what can't he do? Uh, right. I've seen him throwing axes. Mm-hmm. I've seen him bowling like perfect games. Just anything that he is involved in, he just seems to naturally thrive at it. Right. I I very much enjoyed that Joe was saying the the heat at the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, as the uh, if you don't stop chanting USA, I'll leave. And then he leaves and does the most graceful roll into the ring by diving. Unbelievable. <laughs> It was just so fluid. I also liked that he was so animated during the sunset flip. He tossed Pepper Park like a lawn dart. Mm. He did. Yes. Uh, The tornado DDT looked insanely vicious. Mm. It's Joe was saying with like the, you referred to as the the cross face power bomb. He did the same thing with the German suplex right into a submission. Yes. Mm. Right. uh, Again, the fluidity of that was, was just mind-blowing the flying neck breaker i thought was beautiful that uh pepper did yep he did an insane high cross body to the outside of the ring from the top rope (laughs) and then the finish it was something simple but believable Mm -hmm. you know they didn't need to go into this elaborate you know there wasn't false finish false finish false finish false finish this Mm -hmm. was just straight up wrestling looked like they wanted to win Hit a move and beat him. So I, what I was he I teased it just before he hit it. Yeah, he teased doing it just before and got back body dropped out of it, which I thought was cool. He went back for it and was so it just showed, like you said, that competitiveness. It was it was very well done. I remember the guys on that particular night really kind of marking out for the two of them. I know Pepper Parks was actually at a, a sort of a, a, a lull in his career. And was was kind of depressed about it, and he came up to me at the end of the night, and he says, "I, I got to thank you. You guys really made me feel like a pro wrestler tonight." And uh, you know, I just uh, was very touched by that, and uh, was very happy that he felt that way. You know, we had developed a reputation of being able to put on good quality stuff with people around the country. So while this wasn't the great draw that I had hoped that it would be. It was still something that, that added a measure of importance to NECW. It was great for the image of the company. And, you know, it's two top quality guys that, that are appearing in your company. I mean, you know, how do you beat that? That's, right. you know. Right. They look like stars. Yeah. Even they did. back then. Absolutely. Exactly. Pepper Parks yep. at the time lived in Buffalo, New York. I really wanted him to come back. I wanted him to, to come back on a regular basis, but Buffalo is a bit of a hike. You know, Buffalo is a good seven-hour drive. And yeah, that's tough. Anything over five hours is a is a stretch for a lot of guys. Now you're you're talking about either a flight or you're talking about really having to pay him some pretty substantial money, and we just weren't able to do that. But I really wanted to work with Pepper Parks again. Not that I wouldn't want to work with uh, Claudio Castagnoli, but you know, he was already working for Ring of Honor and other people, so getting him 
getting any dates on him would have been difficult. But this is a, a, an example of how relationships help make a company. You know, having that NWA relationship was able to give us a couple of tournament matches that we didn't have to pay for, that brought some really, really top world-class talent into our company and was a treat for our fans. So, And put a lot of eyes on the company, too. Exactly, exactly, because that, that DVD got distributed. So, you know, once again, it's eye, eyeballs on the company. So, right. Very, very good point. So from there, let's take a look at August 8th, 2010. Ariel and Sammy Lane taking on Ivy and Mercedes, the future Sasha Banks. If you had told any of us on this night that Mercedes would become Sasha Banks and become arguably the top female wrestler on the planet Earth, we'd have called you crazy. Not that she wasn't good. Not that she wasn't a nice girl. She was a terrific girl, actually. Yeah. But who knew what she would become? Kev, you were not there at this time. No, I so was not. Let, let, let's get your impressions of, of what you saw and go from there. Well, according to everybody else in New England, the second they saw Mercedes KV, they knew she was going to be a star. So <laughs> at least that's what, what everybody on... <laughs> You know, that's that's what the, the buzz is. Those um, commentators said that, too. Right. Uh. So I I wasn't too familiar with it. I remember hearing the name, but I, I never actually, I, I wasn't around from when she was around. One of my first impressions is Sammy Lane, who just had a birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, Sammy. Yes, happy uh, birthday. I feel she's really underrated. You know, there was when, when she's getting thrown to the ropes... She has this look of shock and concern mm. that maybe it's legitimate, but I took that as, you know, just another aspect of the character. It looked like Mercedes really parlayed Ariel on the face with her foot at one point as she was running in. And, and that's another thing, too. First match, who better to be in there with than Ariel? Amen. Right. You know, she, just the, the, the heel work, just the, the in-ring work. You know, being able to to just lead her through it, it, it was just a perfect matchup. Right. Uh, when BMT tripped her <laughs> as she was hitting the ropes, mm. that looked brutal. I I also like Sammy yelling for help <laughs> when, when she was in trouble. <laughs> that, it, it's something so simple. When right. do you ever see anybody do that? Right. You know, they'll they'll do the dramatic reaching for the tag. You never hear. It, it's such a simple way to get heat. Right. Is to to scream for help. Uh, I loved the taunt when, as uh, Ariel had Mercedes wrapped up, and I believe it was a camel clutch, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then she would take her hand and reach it towards the corner. It's like, go ahead, mm -hmm. tag, tag. I, I, again, you don't see that that often. Right. It was it was cocky. It was arrogant. It was humiliating. It, it was it was just very good heel work. And then it was another believable finish. No, absolutely. It, you know, it, Ariel, we talked about it before, criminally underrated as far as a wrestler goes. Mm -hmm. After her mom passed away, she really wanted to settle down and have kids and so forth, which she did with BMT, that is her husband. Mm -hmm. Oh, have, no kidding. Yep. yep. They, they, she married him. They got Good six kids. Wow. Yeah. They're quite a brood. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful family. Them. Beautiful family they have. Building their own promotion. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. But good for them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So uh, she kind of met her prince, and off they went. That's awesome. Yeah. So good but fairy tale. Wrestling misses her. She's another girl who, you know, if she were coming up around now, you know, she she'd be doing something major. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she was in Ring of Honor for a while, not as a wrestler, but managing the Christopher Street connection in the early part of their, their run, Ring of Honor. She wrestled for Shimmer. She wrestled in Mexico. She wrestled in a lot of places. And she was really a, a, a very accomplished pro. And, and you hit the nail on the head when you said that for Mercedes, what a great person to be in the ring with in your very first match. And, you know, it, it's become sort of a, a match of NECW folklore. Like, we had sat on that match for the longest time and not put it out publicly until this 20th anniversary collection. I deliberately 
wanted to hold on to it for this. But uh, it, it's funny how the, the match has developed such a myth around it. Her very first match is out there somewhere, and we're dying to see if there's a, a guy who's a very big fan of hers who is practically begging me to release <laughs> that match and to put it out there in some way, shape, or form, or, you know, sell him a DVD of it or whatever. It was available as a DVD, and I don't know that it sold very many copies, which is kind of a shame right there, but it was a match that we had to have as part of this 20th anniversary collection. And, uh, yeah, it's, we look back on this whole thing and all the people that you see in this collection, the the ones who have gone on to be big stars, the ones who have gone on to you know, global fame, the ones who may have just passed through, and the ones locally who really, really excelled and maybe didn't get the, their due on a national stage that they should have gotten. It's an interesting series. I think it really reflects well on 20 years of this company. I don't know how you guys feel about that. But like I say, this was it was important for me to do this. It was important for me to put this out. Uh, important for us to celebrate our 20th anniversary milestone. And what better way to do it than by looking back at all this stuff to see, you know, the, the things that we'd done and the way the company's progressed in different ways and uh, the kind of talent that we had, the kind of things that we were able to do in 20 years, especially on the the shoestring budget that we did them on so i think it's a, a pretty good reflection of new england championship wrestling over 20 years so um any other thoughts about these two matches like you were saying sheldon i mean this isn't just a a reflection of the history of necw this is a reflection of the history of the performers mm -hmm. that yeah. that passed through you can't complete their story without starting their story so right. in the case of of sasha of mercedes right. you know without having her first match out there you know you can't even start to tell her story mm -hmm. and and i mean look at just just look at the way that that she could sell in her very right. first match she was fantastic at selling mm -hmm. you know she took all that heat from ariel of course she's working with ariel like kevin right. said mm -hmm. you know who, who better to be in there with and i mean we were putting her over from the first time that we saw her, mm -hmm. we could tell she had talent, right. never knowing where she was going to go at that point. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we talked about saying you can't take Ivy out of that either, though, right? No, and not at all. For, for a perfect partner for her mm. to be teamed up with to help guide her and walk her through and and uh, and show her what she was doing. I mean, the whole the whole match itself as a tag match was perfect. Right. The the psychology of the tag match, the cutting off the ring, there was there was so many elements of that match that made it really really. Uh, a, a great showcase, not mm -hmm. only for Mercedes, but all four of the women, and that's what that's what I think made that so good. I'll tell you what that that when the hot tag happened and Ivy came in, man, she absolutely labeled Ariel in the corner. I mean, mm -hmm. she ate it. I was like, wow, what a shot! Yeah, and seeing that back again, I was like, oh, that looked a little yeah. bit we, little we, heavy there. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about how great Ivy was. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and she you was know. in IWA as well. I mean, she, she had right. a, in Puerto Rico. You know, she was no slouch. She was somebody that, that had, you know, a, a, a good background and a good foundation coming into NECW. I mean, we, we locked out with her. And she wasn't on the local scene that long, unfortunately. But we were, again, we were fortunate to have her for the length of time that we did, especially in that particular match. You're right. What a great partner for Mercedes. Yeah, it was a good mm -hmm. showcase, and I'll tell you what, it was a pretty special feeling knowing that the two of us got to call that match. Yes. Um, that was that was really cool. Right. You know, the, the role of women's wrestling in NECW is, 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 is great. I mean, we really emphasize women's wrestling in a positive way. Nobody else in New England really did it. We were the ones that really put women's wrestling on the map in New England. In a, in a very, and not very as a gimmick. way. Not, not as, as a gimmick. gimmick right. as a no, it was, it was competitive. Right. It, was, yeah. it was good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody had been doing that. I think that's something that a lot of people overlook about us is uh, our commitment to women's wrestling and the fact that we put on so many great women's matches and we did it with largely local talent. Right. And look where they've all gone. A lot of them have gone on to. Right. So. Yeah. So. And then also looking at the history too, if mm -hmm. you look at it from a fan's perspective, mm -hmm. 
to be that up close and personal with so many national stars, people that you see every week on television now. Right. You know, like your Sasha Banks, your Finn Balor, your Cesaro, your your Blade, uh, Becky Lynch, mm-hmm. Billy mm-hmm. Kay, John Cena, Frankie Kazan, like all these people. When would Eddie you ever, Edwards. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When would you get the opportunity to see them that close? You right. know, being able to... You, you go to any you know large venue now and yeah you can see them but that that personal intimate thank setting. you intimate mm-hmm. yes. atmosphere mm-hmm. yes you know I, I i don't take any credit for the careers of, of of any of these people but at the same time NECW had a very important role to play in each of their careers you know we we never trained anybody at least not in the basics. I mean, maybe we might have showed them how to work for TV or it might have given them their first opportunity to do promos or be involved in any sort of television. But I would say that, you know, I, I can't take credit for Eddie Edwards' career, but I can tell you this. Had any CW not booked Sumi Sakai, Eddie Edwards doesn't go to Japan. Eddie right. Edwards doesn't get in pro wrestling, Noah. Eddie Edwards doesn't get that foundation that made him the international star that he eventually became. Again, we're not taking credit for the career of Eddie Edwards, but I think it's important to note that we did play an important role in in a lot of people's careers. And I I think that uh, independent companies, especially this one, tend to be overlooked in a lot of respects. And that's another reason for this series, that we should not be overlooked. Now, we're not the only ones. My good friend Dave Marquez was making a post about this on Facebook just yesterday about how you know a lot of people overlook all the guys that, that he's booked and put on television before they became top stars in national promotions. Right. And he's right. Without companies like Championship Wrestling from Hollywood and NECW and you know so many others... I mean, we're the backbone of pro wrestling. And it's more than just matches. It's opportunity. Right. You know, it's creating moments. It's giving people that opportunity to to get in there, you know, show what they can do, try to get more eyes on them. You know, Mm -hmm. and and it's, like you were saying, not to take credit for it, but it's what they do with that opportunity. Right. And giving them the chance to be seen on a broader basis. Yeah, you got to cut your teeth somewhere. Right, and we were doing, you know, putting matches online and distributing things, you know, before it was hip to do that. So, I mean, you don't get to go anywhere if people can't see you. You don't get booked if you can't be seen. But it's not just being seen. It's being given the opportunity to perform in an environment that allows you to cut promos, that allows you to be in angles and programs, and allows you to develop as a complete pro wrestler. You know, prior to NECW, most of of what passed for independent wrestling in New England was spot shows. and No episodic matches, right? right, Not that there's anything wrong with spot shows, but, you know, you don't get to become the complete package unless you can carry a program, unless you can cut a promo, unless you can carry your part in the role of an angle. Without those skills, you're not really a pro wrestler. So to give people their first opportunity to do that, you know, that, that that's a big thing. That's a, a big contribution that NECW made to wrestling in New England that I, I think a lot of people coming up now who weren't around 20 years ago, they're getting to see that when they watch this series. Let me ask you guys this. Do you have matches that you wish you had seen in this series but didn't get to see? Yeah, there were a few, I think. I think that I, yeah. Or maybe... Yeah. Without giving specific, maybe it's individual people that we left out. I can think of a couple off the top of my head in this series that uh, we didn't get a chance to see. One of them would have been Jason Blade. Rick Fuller is in the Legendary series, but he's not. Oh, well, yeah, he is seen in this series in the, the Evan Six match. You get to see a glimpse of Rick Fuller, but you don't really get to see Rick Fuller in action uh, in this series. You do get to see him in action in the Legendary series. Jason Blade is one that kind of. Uh, uh, and I just pulled some matches of his, so we'll we'll be showing them in a flashback at some point in time or another. But uh, 
Kevin, anything that uh, you want uh, to see that you Yeah, there's this... Right off the bat, the Tag Team Classic, because that, that was my baby. You you let mm-hmm. me run with that. Right. So anything anything from that, that was something I was very proud of. Mm-hmm. Another one of my, my quote-unquote babies was Chris Pyro versus Devin Blaze. Okay. In the... Was it the, the Funhouse match? I forget what I called yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, that, that just had... It, it was one of those things where... Uh, again, I talked about McCarthy being my muse. Mm-hmm. Blaze was starting to take that spot. Um, I had so many ideas with that, and and when we were talking about the match, there was one spot in particular because they wanted to use thumbtacks. Mm. Mm. And for whatever reason, I thought, what if we filled a pinata with thumbtacks? Because nobody would expect <laughs> that. And and the reaction that that got, I was very proud of. Mm. And then the other two matches and that both involve Mike McCarthy, is Mike McCarthy versus Scott Levesque for the NECW Championship. Okay. Um, that was one that I wanted to push Levesque a little bit more because I knew what he was capable of. Mm-hmm. Sensational Scott Levesque is one of those people where if he believed in himself as much as I believed in him, he'd be on television. Amen. I, I Amen. Just, he, he was just, He had the intensity of Randy Savage, the unpredictability of a Brian Pillman and and he, he can work he was a, a technician and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I just always felt that he could do so much more than what he would let himself do and then the last one that I could think of is McCarthy versus uh, David Finley yes yes we'll have to dig that one out David Finley yeah. of course the son of Fit Finley David Finley is uh, currently in New Japan. In New Japan, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He grew up in Atlanta. So Sumi Sakai was the one that connected him to us. And that was just a hard-hitting match. It was great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, tell you what. Let's move on to our bonus match. Let's take a look at this one. This is the very first appearance in NECW of Darling Damon as he takes on the Japanese Nightmare, as he was built at that time. Kahagas. Let's take a look at that match right now, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. Brian Cairo, who must be vacationing in Provincetown. Let's find out what it's all about. In case you don't know who I am, I am Brian Cairo. Now, how many of you people like the beloved people? Well, I got news for you. They stink and they can't get it done. Oh boy, Cairo on the warpath. Just like that, the Celtics won't get it done. And I promise you, I promise you the Red Sox will never get it done again. But the man who will get it done is the man who is introducing grace and elegance to this sport. Darling Damon. Oh my. Now you can look, but you can't touch as he destroys the next person that comes through those curtains. Well, I think Mr. Darling Damon's going to have a tough time of that. Brian Cairo. Oh my goodness. Brian Cairo's latest discovery. Darling Damon. And as I said, he's not going to have an easy time of it with his opponent. The Japanese Nightmare Kahagas. I 
Vegas making a very impressive showing for himself in the Iron Age Championship. Had a tremendous match with the Golden Greek Alex Arion in the opening round of that tournament. Kahag is sticking around trying to get some gold for himself here in NECW in this 16-man television championship tournament. Oh, look at that. My, oh, my. Damon uh, waving to his public there. Try to get this thing underway. Referee Rob Tuttle, I think, is going to have a not so easy time of it. The hag is all business. There goes the bell. As we get this one underway in front of this gigantic crowd here at the Hot Dog Safari at Suffolk Downs in East Boston, Massachusetts. Let's see what uh, Darling Damon brings to the table. Oh. Damon backs up. Damon taking off his little uh, hair accessory there. That kid's gonna spend a lot of time doing his hair. The hag is one tough customer. Collar elbow tie up, Darling Damon winds up the arm. Damon takes him over. Damon telling everybody he can wrestle. How sweet. Kahagas <laughs> uh, not knowing quite what to make of Darling Damon. Side headlock by Cahagas. Cahagas winds up the arm. Darling Damon in a little bit of trouble here. Folks, don't forget the DVD of the 2008 Iron Age Championship will be available in the next couple of weeks. We've also got the best of World Women's Wrestling, World Women's Wrestling best of TV matches, and more releases to come, all from NECW home video. Darling Damon being a little cautious with Cahagas. Sporting good idea. Another elbow tie up, waist lock, go behind by Darling Damon. I think he likes that. Oh man, back elbow right to the jaw. The Haggis with a reversal. Damon shoved off into the ropes. Ducks the clothesline, goes behind. Nice trip out. As he walks over, Kahagas. Cahagas didn't like that. Big chop by Cahagas. Kick to the hamstring. Sends Darling Damon out to the concrete. And his manager, Brian Cairo. Brian Cairo telling Cahagas to back up. Not a good idea. Darling Damon gets an opening here. Come on, get 
chop by Darling Damon. Cahagas now sends him face first into the apron and a big chop right there. Darling Damon again sent head first into the apron. Big chop and Darling Damon backed up right there. Cahagas sends Damon back into the ring. And Damon drops the elbow right on the small of the back of Cahagas. Damon with a kick to the rib cage. Breaks the fingernails across the back of Cahagas. Damon pounding away across the chest of the Japanese nightmare. Kick to the midsection now, and another. Damon drives Cahagas into the corner. Whip to the opposite side. Cahagas took the buckle hard. Damon giving him the bad mouth. And now Darling Damon in control. Picks him up, drops him in a full body slam. Damon off the ropes, drops the elbow, but nobody home. And another kick to the rib cage. Backed up Cahagas. Darling Damon choking Cahagas on that middle rope. Cahagas trying to pull himself together, folks. Next week, here on NECW TV, oh, Darling Damon going to work on Cahagas. And now Brian Cairo getting his licks in. Now Damon with a kick to the rib cage. Folks, next week here on NECW TV, a major announcement regarding myself and Sean Corman. Be on the lookout for that. You'll find it interesting. Oh, Damon just got his man parts rattled, and oh, Cahagas just filled him with a kick. Big kick by Cahagas. Damon gets backed up again by the feet of Cahagas off the ropes. Big chop levels Darling Damon. Damon in the corner now. Cahagas with a headbutt and a big chop. Cahagas chopping away. Damon out in the corner. And now Cahagas. Irish whip reversed. Cahagas in the corner. Grabs Damon, drops him face first into the second turnbuckle. And now Cahagas saying this is gonna be it. Cahagas setting him up. Has him upstairs and just drives him down right on the back of his neck. Here's a cover and say good night. Cahagas with a victory as he advances in the television championship tournament. And Darling Damon is going to be shipped back off to P Town and the beauty parlor. The Haggis, your victor this week on NECW TV. Don't go away. We've got more after this. All right. The Hot Dog Safari from June 1st of 2008. Kevin, you were not around at that point in time. Let's, let's start with you and get your impressions. <laughs> right off the bat, cheap heat ski. The, uh, <laughs> just, just blatant. Absolutely blatant. I really enjoyed the clash of styles, you know, with, with Damon mm. doing the flamboyant and Cahagas just, you know, with that strong style. Right. 
he did a flat liner into the buckle, which I had never seen before. Mm. And and that really impressed me. I'm surprised that uh well, maybe I, I do know why people don't do that move because it did look <laughs> pretty brutal. Mm. And uh, I, I really liked the atmosphere there. I mean, it looked really special. You know, you had the people in the grandstands, you had the people around the ring. There was one great shot of the camera going straight up, and you could see like the the bright blue sky and the clouds. Yes, uh, it was. It was just. It, it seemed like it was a, a very fun atmosphere. Oh, it was. Yeah, Joey, it absolutely we, was. You were there, right? I was there during that. Oh, yeah, man. I was at the time. I wasn't doing commentary, but I was doing the interviews and stuff right, in the back. Right. And um, I was actually out there for that match. You can hear me at one point um, off camera, mm. trying. I was trying to move the crowd away from one of the cameras. Mm. And watching that match, boy, do you miss the crowds? You sure I do. I miss miss those crowds. That crowd was a. They were always fun. And this was a tournament that lasted all day. Right. So we must have had what. 16 matches 20 right. matches mm -hmm. something like that yeah so it was it so people just filtered in and it just kept going until the end which was perfect for something like that because it's such a long day mm -hmm. was that 16 um, straight or would you have breaks in between was it like, like um, an event at 11 one at one and, and something like that or was it just sort of no it just it ran the whole day i think yeah 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 oh yeah so there was always so we give you enough everybody have enough time they could go filter down, get another hot dog, come back up and grab their seat again. And and there were little events and, and things for the kids to do. So they'd be running back and forth. There was always a crowd shuffling around it. And then the next match would come. And some, they'd always keep an eye on it. The crowd would. And there was something would catch their eye. And like when Cahagas came out, all of a sudden that side of the ring, everybody jammed to the side of it because right. he was impressive looking. The guy looked mm -hmm. like a killer. Yeah. yeah. That Still was what was so cool. Oh man, he was unbelievable. Great town. We brought him in for the Iron Eight. Yes. Uh, that's the first time I got to meet him, right. and that was that was um, 2008's Iron Eight. That's correct. And, um, mm -hmm. and then he, we had him for the Hot Dog Safari, which was dynamite. He was just mm -hmm. he was incredible. Great, great guy. But you know, the one thing caught my attention that that you that I saw from Damon. Talk about ring presence mm -hmm. for his first match being with us in an environment like that. Now you got to admit that's kind of a carnival type. Uh, environment, right? With everybody's kind of fun, you can work that crowd and you can really deal with them. At, at one point, it spilled outside with Cahagas and him and Cairo. Cairo got in the way mm. and got himself thrown across the, the outside of the ring, which I kind of laughed about. But he had enough presence, Damon did, to duck under the ropes real quick and break that count mm -hmm. and go back out to c continue doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Little things like that yeah. that wasn't going to cause the referee to have to come outside and and you know, he gave complete credibility to the referee by by doing that and little things like that i saw um and he can work that crowd like nobody can damon right. can just and, with a glance just with a look and that's brave in a situation like that with the crowd like that you <laughs> yeah, know he was oh, yeah. when, when yeah. you when you said you know you you get a little bit too much heat one way or the other, and it, it could get in East Boston. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That that hot dog safari was a great event, family event. Yeah, for good cause. I mean, there had to be fifteen hundred people around that ring, between yeah. the grandstands and, and and around. There had to be fifteen hundred people at any given time. I mean, when does an independent guy get to perform in front of a crowd like that? Right, right. And it's, yeah. the, the other thing, too, the Hot Dog Safari, for those that are not from this area, is an event that always got a lot of publicity. Eddie Andelman was a local radio talk show host, a sports talk guy, for many years. Had a lot of media connections. His sons run the Phantom Gourmet. Big media guys in Boston. And, you know, anything Eddie would do, especially something like this, which was for charity... It always get covered. In fact, the next year that we did this, the Comcast channel, CN8, which they don't have anymore, but they did it one time, actually did a live shot. We did a live shot with them from that, and some of the matches were broadcast on their local television. It was a big deal, media-wise. So to be a part of something like that was a, a big deal. And the other thing that came out of that is... Uh, the guy that produced the hot dog safari for Eddie Emmelman was Anthony Pepe, who was the general manager of 
1510 The Zone, and that's how we got to do the Mouthpiece Wrestling Show. And the rest is history. The rest, as they say, is history, right? Well, well, <laughs> yeah. Right. But now they... Or if we're keeping it with radio, it's the rest of the story. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> But, uh, in fact, in the commentary, we even pitched the idea that we're going to be starting up that show. That's right. All right. Now, so it was a big deal to do that. And one of the things that we did as a, a, a promotional thing was we, we did a mini program. It almost looked like an oversized matchbook. One sheet of paper they had listed the matches and what was going to, going to go on. And there was a, a coupon for $2 off an admission or buy one, get one, I forget. And I think it might have been two, it was either $2 off or it was buy one, get one, I forget now. But we would hand them out to people. We had thousands of them made, we were handing them out to people so that they would go home with something from, from us. Uh, and there was a way for us to promote our business. So, and that was something that, that other companies in the area never, never got anything like that. You know, that was a big thing to put us on the map locally and give us... Um, some local credibility so uh, a very important thing for us and uh, worked out really well but yeah uh cahagas became nwa world heavyweight champion nwa north american champion he would appear for us a number of years later in a match against brad hollister that was the key match in launching brad hollister towards stardom and towards the necw heavyweight championship it, it, we'll have to dig that out. That's another instance of somebody being better for losing a match. Mm -hmm. Told a uh, great story. Yes. Again, you don't have to. You don't have to go over to get over. Exactly. 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 Um, we're, I'm going to dig that out for a future bonus match, and we'll we'll uh, we'll take a look at that because that that really was a. Uh, I was very proud of that. We had done uh, a thing with Brad Hollister where initially he just got creamed by apocalypse to the point where we were going to you know toss him out of the company for his own good and then he finally manages to eke out a win and saved his career and then you know he'd be in competitive matches with people and then this match with Cahagas where he doesn't win the match but he wins Cahagas's respect and the crowd's respect at the same time so again we'll, we'll dig that out and show it at some point again Another example of how booking makes somebody. What about making reference to the uh, NECW Legends Awards? Because you figured almost everyone that won them has been in the series. We have right. Sabotage, Maverick, Ariel, Darling Damon. By the Flame received one, but she wasn't it. But we've mentioned her. Nikki right. Valentine had Nikki one. Valentine. Mm -hmm. and, you know. I didn't want to do a Hall of Fame. So we created the NECW Legend Award just to acknowledge... You know, people that have meant a lot to the company over the years and, and the ones who would be willing to show up to get the award. <laughs> That's kind of important, you know. We, you know, uh, you got to show up to get it. So, But, no, all those people were very important to us, and we wanted to give them a measure of importance, too. It would be egotistical of us to launch a Hall of Fame. Oh, Although, yeah. after being around for 20 years, it also becomes a cliche, you know. I see right. other companies like, you know, Chaotic had a Hall of Fame BS. It's the equivalent of calling whatever building you're running in, you know, the NECW arena. Right. Exactly. Without it being the uh, NECW exactly. arena. Right. Exactly. 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 And New England already has their own Hall of Fame for all of New England. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is more site-specific to NECW. And I think right. having the Legends Award, it, it, you're an NECW legend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That just makes more sense. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we didn't get a chance to see Violet Flame in the series. We'll have to take out a, a Violet Flame match at some point in time or another. Uh, I have stockpiled a, a number of matches that we are going to show you in, in the weeks to come. Let's see. I, I just dug out the match that took place uh, in November of 2007 between Tanya Lee and Ryan Matthews. <laughs> he was the one that I was going to say I'd love to see some matches on. Yeah. So that's perfect. There is a match in the Legendary Series between Rick Fuller and Ryan Matthews, <laughs> which uh, the ultimate squash match. 
Rick Fuller does his famous chop to the chest and actually leaves his handprint on the chest of Ryan Matthews. I, you Been know, there. Rick Fuller had such a chop. It was unbelievable. I'm yeah. shocked that nobody went into cardiac arrest over it. Yep. Uh, he hit me with it. That's part of the legendary series. That's already online. So if you look that up, that that's good for a few less. Ryan Matthews was not what you would call a great wrestler. But a, a comedy figure. And there's a, a, a place for comedy in, in company. But he didn't have wrestling. to be. He didn't have to be. His gimmick was great. He was fantastic. His timing was excellent. Right. Everything about that kid mm -hmm. was gold. And if you if you took him at face value, shame on you. Right. You, know, you judge mm -hmm. that book by its cover, you're missing out a good read. But now when I... We I brought, when we brought Grandpa Robbie into the mix. Yes. And this... Again, it's Kevin just, doesn't know what we're talking about. Explain oh, what we're talking about. Kevin, oh I, my God. I, I have an idea and I hope I'm wrong. Uh, no, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did this angle with, with, with Ryan Matthews where he goes on this goofy winning streak. And he comes to me and he says he wants to get a match for the NECW Television Championship. And I'm saying, nah, it's not going to happen. No, no, no. Then he goes, well, I just, I'm going to bring my grandfather. And, you know, you know, he's getting up there in years. And he doesn't have a lot of time left. And I, I just wanted to have my grandfather see me wrestle for the title once before he passes away. So being the softy that I am, uh, I agree to this. And, of course, the Grandpa is Robbie Ellis. Yeah, that's where I thought it was going. <laughs> right. And they managed to, to screw, was it Chris Pyro out of the title? Chris or, Pyro, yes. I believe, yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, uh, it was the, one of the best angles, funnest things mm. to to sit back and, and put together. Oh, my God, we had so much fun putting that together. Right. I had this thing about Robbie. Everybody used to, Robbie Ellis used to pay to be on cards. Right. He used to pay. He never yeah. paid me to be on a card. No. I, I I would book him and actually pay him. Believe it or not, I, I I never went to him for money. He did offer it once. I didn't take it. I didn't want to be beholden to him in that regard. But he didn't uh, offer you money to wrestle certain people. No, 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 no. He uh, was a character. That's for sure. <laughs> I always was afraid that Robbie Ellis would legitimately die in the ring on one of our shows and that would be the end of us you know and the guy was a senior citizen I but mean, damn oh, yeah. looked good he did he did, he did. For, yes i mean and he would say yeah, i'm in better shape than most of these guys in the car and he'd be right yep. yeah but it doesn't matter i mean you get up to a certain age and like uh that becomes a dicey proposition you know dicey proposition. they would have thought it was a work yeah yeah <laughs> right <laughs> I'll leave some of the other stuff out of it. Oh, in, in the early days of NECW, we, we did this angle where where Robbie goes on this crazy winning streak and he wants a shot at the title, demands a shot at the title. And I say, well, you know, I'm not going to give it to you. And he got me to admit that I thought he was too old. And we had a Greg Savarese who was playing the role of an attorney. L. <laughs> Spencer Greenwood Esquire comes out of the audience and threatens to sue me for age discrimination. <laughs> so the idea was he gets he, he, he has one more person he has to beat in order to get a title shot and it was Mercedes Martinez and she cleaned his clock <laughs> so I thought Good you know if you, if you could take somebody like that and be creative with them and make something out of them then you're that that's good booking I mean I might rethink that you know if, if I had it to do all over again <laughs> but but you know, when you're starting out and you're trying to to you know come up with different things, you 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 know that's what happens. You come up with ideas like that. Oh. And that was one of those ones that just it just kept rolling off of us how we were going to. This is when we had the whole team of us right. sitting around the table mm -hmm. trying to figure out. And this is when everybody we had something for everybody. Right. There was no fillers. I mean, you know, we had we had something from Eddie Edwards and. And Max Bauer down to to Robbie Ellis and Davey Loomis. Mm -hmm, right. I mean, we had some you know we had some good little things going with these guys. Mm. 
You know, I was telling you that I've been going through a lot of the old matches in, in putting the series together and just recently in coming up with these NECW flashback matches. And there's a period of time from 2005 to 2009, all, all the, the weekly TV things that we did that were online, but we hosted them on our own website rather than put them up on YouTube. Because YouTube was a new thing when we started, YouTube right. really didn't exist. So, you know, we didn't we didn't post our matches on YouTube in the beginning. We posted them on our own website, and we would crash servers left and right because of the bandwidth. But all those matches from like about a five year period are no longer online. So we've been adding them back through this through this series, the 20th anniversary collection of the legendary series and these NECW flashbacks uh, because they, they deserve to be seen. A lot of that stuff deserves to be you know, put out there again. And if it doesn't get put out there, then you know, it just disappears from everybody's sight and mind. So, you know, again, it's important to have people to be able to access our history, at least to me anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I've gotten a few people that have commented to me on how much they've enjoyed seeing these things again. And how surprised they are at the, the people that we've had, you know, wrestle for us over the years and the quality. And even the people that, you know, the locals, the Alex Arians and so forth. How, let me ask you, that's an interesting question for both of you. What have you seen in this series that you hadn't seen before that was surprising to you? Or really, like, piqued your interest and really kind of caught your imagination? Something that you hadn't seen before or hadn't been a part of? Uh, well, immediately, I think of the John Cena, Frankie Kazarian. Yeah. You know, the fact that both of them came through there. I I had heard that they mm -hmm. were through. I had never mm -hmm. actually seen the match. Right. See, there was a lot of things that happened just before I came on. Yeah. And then immediately following when I left. Right. And, and, and I wish I stuck around for the time when Kevin came on board because I think the creative process and what, what I saw from you right. guys was some of the best stuff that... I would have wanted to be a part of. Mm -hmm. I think when you bring in the Mike McCarthy's and the Toro, uh, Total Locos and mm -hmm. and um, you know when we had Escobar was in there and you had you know all these other a lot of the girls and the guys and even the the ones that I knew you know when Bobby Fish came back mm -hmm. and you know and, and beat Brandon Locke and there was there was so many I was just barely around for any of those. Right. Well, that that um, whole you know, Bobby Fish thing. And out. That that old Bobby Fish comeback that was uh, a mixed bag. I mean, Bobby yeah. Fish is great, but I mean, George Carroll wanted to put the title on Bobby Fish, and that's great because Bobby Fish is great. But the only problem was Bobby Fish wasn't available to us. Right. He made one title defense. One. Yeah. One. What good is the guy with the title if he's not around to defend it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it just was, you know, again. But that was a problem that we seemed to consistently run into. You know, we we put put the company on somebody's shoulders, and either the pressure gets too much to them, or they get hurt, or you know, there, there was a couple of times where we we banked on people's strengths, and we ended up having to last minute shuffle things around. Right at that point, you know, once uh, once I took the book after after George, you know, we started a book with a lot more depth. We started to you can keep, see it. Yeah, you started to see yeah. the, the change in how things were booked so that in case you had situations like that, that you had somebody to go to. That you, well, that's you, it. You, I, you, I noticed you, how you guys did that. Right. You planted a lot. We planted a lot of seeds, and we made sure that we had a, a, a card that had depth just in case something happened to somebody, anybody, no yeah, matter always, where they were in the card. Always having somebody on the bench that's ready to step up when needed. Right. That that's Next extremely man important. Up. That's, and yep. it's I think it's interesting, like you were saying, Joe, how you wish that you would suck around. Mm. I wish I was there beforehand, before <laughs> I got there. <laughs> right. Because I, I just feel like again there, there could have been so much creativity, so much working together for the better and of the company. Honestly, and 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 I mean this like with all sincerity, you would have been frustrated yeah. mm -hmm. being when when I was there. 
with because of what we had to put up with, what we had to deal with, and how we were able to 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 because your ideas would have only gotten so far, mm-hmm. and and when you were much better. That's why I wish I was where you were. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I I love being where I was. I love being involved with what I did. But seeing what you guys were able to do afterwards, and like you said, Sheldon, on a shoestring, mm-hmm. that's that's some of the more proud things that I think you guys could be able to to take credit for and, and mm-hmm. sit back and mm-hmm. you know put your hat on that, saying this is what we did. You know, you don't you don't have a, a quote unquote team of people that you know can jump in and say that they had everything to do with what went on. You know what I mean? That was you guys, mm-hmm. and and uh, you know to bring in guys and like you were talking about Brad Hollister. You know, I didn't. I never got to see him. Mm-hmm. You know, Matt Taven. I only got to see him once. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was when I was visiting a show. You know, and some of the other guys that you guys had involved that moved on to bigger and better. Um, you know, and and up and up. You know, uh, Richard Holiday. You yeah. know, mm-hmm. guys that I'd only heard of. Right. You know what I mean? And um, and never really got to see. So. You know, that's that to me is very intriguing. Like, I'd love to go watch the entire series you guys had when you guys were on TV Mm -hmm. from step one to to the end to follow the Mm storylines. You know, that's something that I would I would binge watch something like that. It's all on YouTube. (laughs) Exactly. It's all up there. Exactly. Well, I tell a lot of people to do it, yeah. you know, to be involved where I was and and to be that interested in what what happened after I left. You know, and I kind of, it's its disheartening for me why I left. Because mm. I didn't leave on my terms. Right. I didn't walk away because that's what I wanted to do because mm. I was finished. And that leaves a big gap in what I was able to do and not right. do and wish I had done. So mm. this series has been, what well, these podcasts, I don't know if you understand how important it's been to me to be a part of because it's able to to give me a little bit well i know it's a been little important. bit more of my insight it's been important to me to have you as a part of it absolutely so you know i'm, I'm very thankful very grateful for it it's a long journey and it was full of ups and downs i wouldn't trade it for anything e- even the parts that were dark days but i i look at something like this and you see everything that's been done or you get a sense of everything that's been done. And what a ride. For all the... <laughs> Who gets to do this? <laughs> right. For, for, for all the negative stuff, look at the positives. Oh, yeah. Look at what was done. That, that was really our hands doing it. The, the things that we were a part of. Just the promotions, the radio show. Being right. on radio, and we'll talk about this in a future episode, opened up a lot of possibilities for us because we had that media exposure. Exactly. We did the promotion with the Lowell Devils. What what a great thing that was. You know, to see fans three and four deep getting autographs from your talent, you know, and participating in some of the things like uh, Handsome did something on the ice there. I forget what it was, but it was some foolish, crazy thing that he volunteered to do. But, you know, just those things. The Hot Dog Safari is another one. You know, you, you saw that. The, the crowds, the people that showed up for that and you know, were just delighted to see what we were doing. I mean, those are special moments. And then to see some of this talent, some of these people go and and become national and international stars. You, you see somebody like... and Next week, we're, I'm going to show you a match that Alexis Nevea, Alicia Edwards, was involved in at the Brockton Fair. That is the damnedest thing I have ever seen... In a women's match. I won't spoil it for you. It, it's been on our TV, but I won't spoil it. We'll have that next week as our bonus match. And uh, we'll talk about it then. But, I mean, it, it shows her evolution. From the little girl from New Bedford who didn't want to cut promos. To this girl with all the confidence in the world. And she gets on the mic at the end. And she's like the rock. She's She's <laughs> chatting it up like... The promo queen of uh, of America. I mean, it, it's crazy, but to see her evolution is a, a is a fun thing to see and a rewarding thing to see. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. Well, next week, uh, I think what we're going to do is do one more show. 
about the 20th anniversary collection. I'm going to see if we can get uh, Brian Nadeau or uh, Anthony on here, and we'll we'll oh, talk nice. about production of stuff and uh, get their input on the series and uh, matters of NECW production and so forth. So uh, we'll look forward to that. And that's going to wrap it up for us. So for Joe Matarazzo and Kevin Castro, I'm Sheldon Goldberg. Thank you for joining us, everyone. We'll see you again next week. The Regeneration Podcast is a production of New England Championship Wrestling. To send us questions, comments, or feedback, email us at regenerationnecw at gmail.com.